This is the big reveal, guys. <laughs> uh, we see Kavan in his element. Where were you cooking? First time I ever made was burn to death in the broth. We get a lot of flack for being the ring. So we've had people come in and say, hey, I've been trying to get this reservation for three months, six or whatever, just one year. There's some lady who said three years. I said, hey man, we weren't uh, open three years ago. I'm not going to ask you to make me a ramen. I don't want to eat your ramen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, but like... Hi everyone, welcome back to the Season Podcast, a show where we dive into the world of hospitality and the people that run it. I'm Adrian and I'm very excited for today's episode. And I'm Tushar Sund and I'm fucking excited for this one. Um, the guest that we have today, he's on the list of the 30 best chefs in the country. His restaurant is ranked at the top 50 restaurants. Uh, at the moment, and they recently were one of the two restaurants to get four stars from Culinary Culture in Uto. Uh, the man of VR, <laughs> Chef Tawan Kutapa, welcome to the show, Chef. It's an absolute you. pleasure to have you. How has it been? Like a lot of milestones recently, married, I know. so many awards. Uh, how is it going? It's uh, surreal to say the least, you know, but uh, I think everything was jam packed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you say marriage, right? I think the day after my wedding, I was at Nal. Okay. Because it was all really dusting from the and I had to get it open because uh, I'm not used to Naru being shut for too long. And I think we shut over a month or so. But we were here and we were doing a bunch of pop-ups right there. Yeah, yeah. So it never felt like we were shut. This had their own programming coming. In the court, uh, on the way, they had their own mm. program coming. And that's when I was like, we had to start soon, right? And small things were taking time, you know, small places, larger places get done because you have a team for everything. Mm. When this, like, it was a lot dependent on, say, one person or two people doing a lot more. Oh, yeah. yeah. But this is uh, once you guys reopened after the adding the 25 pounds. Uh, tw- we were eight, we went to 20. Okay. So we added 12 covers. 12 covers. And uh, that's the time. There's two weeks we were shot. Uh, we opened December 15th, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but the first half of December, which is a high grossing month, oh, we were door shut. Wow. So, uh, and that, that was there. That was the push that was required, you know. And uh, we opened and then it's been good so far, yeah. But has adding the covers helped with the reservation situations? <laughs> so I, we, <laughs> no, no, people DM me all the time, but um, we did add 12 covers, right? So there was a certain thing and we made it very specific. If you want to eat four people, you book the table. Less than four makes sense on the counter also because imagine there was four of us sitting like this. Mm. This first person in Adrian would never speak mm. because of just the setup, right? right. People in India like to eat uh, together mm. as a group and often in larger groups. But we said, okay, it's a small restaurant, it's uh, 20 seats, right? Mm. A four-seater team, like 20% of it. Yeah. yeah. So, first thing we can sit together, eat on day, me, counter seats, we limit it to three. But yeah, no, it didn't help with the reservations because it's still... Yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's Touch still, it's, 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 it's the dream, it's, like, it's I nice. Think. But you should go through the comments on any of our posts or something. It's, <laughs> it's bad. It's just me, they're just coming you guys never out. getting... But yeah. as a business, I think that's the dream, right? Now, you've been sold out from the day you guys opened the Eight Cover Restaurant, I think. Yeah, I mean, um, so we've had people come in and say, hey, I've been trying to get this reservation for three months, six months, nine months, one year. Yesterday, last week, we had one and a half years. There's some lady who said three years. I said, <laughs> hey, man, um, we weren't uh, open three years ago. Year but she says, no, from your takeaway, Mm. I've been trying since you started doing takeaway in the lockdown and we've not been able to get a ramen. So it's not that difficult yeah. right? because there's people who come every week. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, certainly back to the lockdown bonus and hope was that how long before you know, the whole cloud kitchen and the kit model started, how long before that did you have it in your head that you know you want to do the ramen? Mm. Because your earlier restaurants like 
Olive and then Permitru. Oh. These were not really Asian places or Hudoi, which you were like popular for making amazing broth back then also. Like in Olive, they would always talk about the Jew. Oh, the Jew, yeah. So I think I had my first ramen in New York, right? That's mm. what I say. And that's, the, that's when I realized, hey, there's a dish like this that is so interesting. It's one bowl, it's one bowl yeah. meal. Mm. And it's very, very satisfying, right? You don't need anything else. Right. You don't need an appetizer or a dessert. It's just one bowl. It's a quick eating bowl. Okay. And when I had my first bowl, I'm like, oh, there's nothing like this here back home. That was like uh, 13 years ago, right? But then it was there in the back of my head. And I enjoyed eating ramen wherever I went. Right. Whichever country, whichever situation. It didn't have to be Japan. Mm. Anywhere. Mm. And um, I couldn't find it. But I felt like being professionally trained as a chef uh, put me in some capacity to do something about it. Right. Yeah. Truth. I mean, if you can't get a food of your choice here, you will try to make it right. That's that's why we sort of came for, across this. But yes, when I was training my internship in Eleven Madison, I was on the stocks, stock duty, and I was a it's broth pretty much. Mm-hmm. That is renews, renews, renews down to you. So that concept sort of uh, stayed alive. I did a bunch of other things, but uh, I'm making ramen before the lockdown requirements. And it's a long cook time, so we left it overnight mm. to see, hey, okay, why just we let, let us sleep on this mm. and see if it works. And it was a major fire disaster that was averted because it was charred. It was completely. But we, we didn't calculate <laughs> anything probably. So the first clam on the made was burnt. To get the broth, um, and uh, there's some learning that came out here. You know, we can't just leave it, forget it, set it, and forget about it. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. It doesn't work here then. So yeah, that's. I think lockdown is when I had a little bit of time on my hands. Yeah. To be like, hey, let's try this ramen thing again. Oh. Um, and this time we're a little more prepared, a little more well read about it. Oh. But I'm curious, when, when you were trying to perfect your ramen recipe back then, uh, were you trying to consciously alter the taste to fit the Indian palate per se, or were you just trying to make it as genuine as possible? And the first challenge is finding ingredients that yeah. were listed. Right. All right. You'll see these ramen ingredients listed if you buy like a Japanese ramen bowl. Oh. First of all, you can't read anything, right? <laughs> and if you manage to translate it, you'll realize a lot of these ingredients are very native to Japan. Yeah. And to source a certain breed of chicken from Japan doesn't make sense. Yeah, like, yeah. You have to um, you have to know with what you have here. So then authentic becomes like a local version of it. I yeah, guess. it's a local version of it. I mean chicken is Indian so like the flour is Indian, so really. This is the two main things, right? And then is it authentic? Yeah, it is in terms of technique and uh, the kind of effort you put in it, but uh, it's ramen. Yeah. And with Japanese cuisine, where this guy said either, so she all these are very stringent on laws. Yeah. You can't mm. move out of this small like kamaldri. With ramen, you know, a lot of Indian inspired ones. You know, few which used. Uh, yeah. So that came a little later in the whole ramen learning mm. process. So the first one was to do say tonkotsu is the most popular, right? Why is it more popular? Because most of the chains from that coming out of Japan are tonkotsu chains. Oh. So you go to Europe, you'll find an Ekodo Ip- Ichira. You go to the US, you'll find one. And generally, I think people outside of Japan uh, prefer a rich po tonkotsu god. So ramen being equalized for that. Oh. But natural for us to try that first. Oh. And then we tried a chicken version of the same because this is pork, right? Not even a no. so chicken. So that was the sort of progression. And then slowly you realize, hey, uh, so this is the kind of ramen that's been made in Japan and in the US. What about our contribution to ramen? Or can we do something with it? And then you read around in India, you realize a lot of sort of fire is like a great broth. So the first ever idea I had is not in been done, but like me. I thought we were going to make a great paya mm. and then do a ramen roll and twist on it with some lamb char shoe with water. We need the Japanese spread. Yatmi, yeah, is like a queenie broth. Ooh. And there's two broths uh, from like um, Maharashtra. 
go now. Can't catch the name of it right there. Uh, it'll come to me. But then those are meat based broths, mutton broths that are very similar to a road ramen broth. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so the side is slowly seeing what Indian ingredients go with uh, ramen, you know, because there's no rooms and there's always room for experimental beef. Oh. But you yeah, I plan sometime. Uh, maybe uh, eat Naru in Japan. Yeah, I don't know. If I do, uh, it'll definitely be one of our regional sort of ramen because mm -hmm. that's got more possibility of becoming a sort of a, a favorite yeah. as opposed to cooking something that they already have, right? Uh, it would make sense to give them some like the green chickenies or a green chickenies. Oh no, and there's this mum man, mum's chicken curry that's uh, we made into a ramen. It's like this quintessential chops masala. Like every South Indian household on Sundays, we make a mutton or a chicken curry with this flavor. Mm. And my mom makes a version of it where we eat a lot of curry at home, just the sauce. Mm. So, and we fight for it. So my mom makes more curry uh, in the chicken. Right. Then I was eating it, I'm like, man, this is like a ramen broth because it's chicken, water, and some spice paste. Uh, green chili coriander, green mm. uh, that's just cooked together slowly and then it yields like this broth so then became the process of hey I really want to do this it took me about 8-10 months to finally get to trying it because okay. I was alone cooking at home so I was like uh, mm. how much to experiment you know and, but it turned out and now it's on the menu and I think it'll stay on the menu because that's like a original from Naru, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I tell guests like, you should order this because you will not find it anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, somebody else might make it, but yeah. it's from here, you know. Yeah, that's your contribution to me. Yeah. I guess, I, I hope so at least, yeah. That's been Raman's uh, Chinese cu cuisine, that's what the, that's why Raman is written in not the traditional Japanese model. They are written in Katakana because it's a foreign word. So my name, your name would be written in Kataka. Mm. Though they have a separate script for foreigners who went to words. So all our names would be written in that. And Raman is written in Levan because it's Chinese. Dish. And Raman doesn't come with strict rules. Mm. The more you play around with Raman, there's a chance that somebody and uh, people pick up on mm. it and becomes mm. really popular. Yeah. The broth part is more uh, experimental, right? Noodle sort of. Is like a, was a, as a again some bottomless pit hole mm -hmm. you know, because noodles some noodles pairs better with certain broths. Um, Hakata style donkotsu is a creamy rich broth. Then there's thin noodle for that. Mm -hmm. So and shoyu again is like medium sized, but uh, there's also people who use really thick noodles in like clear soup like udon, udon noodles. Yeah, so udon for and then udon and another. Yeah. Oh. So but yeah they. There's five elements to ramen, and if you tweak all five with multiple permutation combinations, you get different, different, different mm -hmm. ramen. And I think that's how, yeah, that's the basic structure of it. Mm -hmm. And so the the amount of ramen you can make is um, endless. The moment you go from one city to another in Japan, everybody has their own version. I was watching that movie Ramen Heck, which, yeah. um, like, which was one of the poorest models that I could find. And he uses like four different types of broth to make his bowl of ramen. Yes, uh, I think that's a sukemen. Tomita? Tomita. Tomita, yeah. So Tomita uses like a really fish heavy thick, thick soup <laughs> that is like almost long. like, yeah, extra long <coughs> fast noodles that you dip. It's a dipping kind of the thing. Um, and he's like, he's like uh, considered one of the ramen gods of. Uh, Japan, and there's, there's a bunch of them. Like, so there's so a fixed boundary to what ramen is. It's pretty much like no. the five cost two ends of yeah. ramen, and then yeah, I, you know, might even skip one of them if you're very <laughs> eccentric, you know? Like you were saying that initially it was just you. So when the whole Cloud Kitchen model started, mm -hmm. what was the setup like? Like, where were you cooking? And this how was in 2021, if I'm not wrong, is it? 2021, 2020, a little blurred. I think uh, the lockdown hit on second lockdown. Second lockdown. No. So around 2020 end to 2021 beginning is when I was like, okay, it's going to take a while for the restaurants to open up. Hmm. Uh, so what do we do? And uh, so I tried to make a broth. Um, 
now we can't cook like one portion right it's not mm -hmm. difficult for us as like production people to cook small portions so we did um, we did a batch and then had like 10 portions and i sent it out to friends mm -hmm. because when you cook your own food you can't eat it too much you know you want some other people to taste it me like hey Pretty it's good. good so that's how it sort of started and then i think i tried to make the first batch on my on my domestic burner mm. it was like a hob with four small burners mm. was it working out mm. so i called my equipment manufacturer i said i want a small like the canteen stoves mm. they cook shaadi ka food yes. yeah the higher mm. burners uh no the low one no. but the fast burner was better uh, no just the the slotted one not it but okay. uh, he was like happy to get a call because nobody had called him in the lockdown <laughs> everybody's selling their stuff right yeah. and then here i am i'm like can you make one he's like what okay sure but everything is closed but we'll figure out something <laughs> so he made this small burner for me and funny enough it's come found its way back to naru now here because uh, i tell you um so now so i started cooking i bought a pot also and man because of being in the industry where to get what mm. during the lockdown also it was a slightly bit easier easier yeah i think i think my first batch of ramen i didn't have japanese ingredients oh. at home i think i borrowed some from uh, a chef friend palmi from now okay she had she gave me Kong. small small containers of mirin sake just for me to try around first yeah. thing you want to do is tare it's the most intimidating mm -hmm. thing and it's the difficult thing to get right and um, so yeah on like a lot of borrowed stuff first small batch and then found one japanese vendor who was who used to come on the bike and supply to my house yeah in jp nagar it's it was difficult but also it's expensive right all these experiments like all the ingredients for yeah, yeah. it was completely uh, bootstrapped by my i don't know some kind of savings <laughs> right yeah i said um, and while this was happening you were still with the uh, ph yes, four i was with ph four but then i had spoken to them and i said hey we're shut on i mean sitting at home might as well do something with correct now on that time and uh, this thing so that's where i tried to make a batch and then it worked and then i did what 10 20 portions first batch then mm. so then it slowly it like okay, should i make a little bit bigger then finally that pot came in just mm. top or the, the first one that mm. eat no it does not this was a 40 liter bottle oh, okay. because ramen considerably the mm. news is right and uh, the bone to water ratio is also very high so we needed a big pot and got a big pot i don't remember when but the pot happened and that's when the portion number of portions was increasing yeah No, but like making the noodles yourself, and then you could. This was just you, or did you have any help? So uh, just he, just wool, and just been the length. I don't want to think about it. Three days, effort. Right? Three, three days, days, yeah. So yeah, noodles. it was always three days because um, I put this out on a Thursday mm. uh, for sale kind of situation. Mm. And as soon as it got sold, uh, like I started prepping. Mm. Um, <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three days. Sad night used to be the packing, which is the worst night, right? Because I don't want to pack. <laughs> yeah, they're, as no, <laughs> they're like all the things. I do I don't. Like, yeah, I it's just. To later on as well. I was telling them that we blatant, like at Gorilla, I blatantly copied the uh, delivery and the drop model that you guys had. Uh. That you, I, I'm not as meticulous as Eat Naru was because every Tuesday you would drop a drop. But yeah, and my aim was to do that, but I always end up doing it on a Thursday or a Wednesday. No, so wait. when you want if you are trying to build something it has to be consistent consistent yeah. and how long were you doing the cloud kitchen yeah. slash kit model before um, the eight cover uh, i think i did it for a couple of months yes seven eight months at least you know yeah. through the second lockdown mm. and i slowly the restaurant started opening up right. and then i stopped for a bit because obviously work responsibilities were there yeah. and then get back to uh, your regular job right um and somewhere around that time i was like hey man that thing that i did mm. uh, during the lockdown was was very invigorating it kept me more and more you know involved in world and then there's always this uh 
when you can get into any kind of hospitality if you are a bus boy or a waiter or a chef or a steward anything you want to open a restaurant at some point because you are in that whole machine of things right mm. even if you are a store manager i've asked some store managers they're like chef i want to open a restaurant i'm like what <laughs> how you have yeah yeah and few have yeah so it's the innate desire oh. and that came out really heavily post the fact that we knew hey i can cook around you know that's that's the sort of push the fine push i needed so then i was like okay let's do this you know and uh, then i quit the job and then we started planning for naru and i didn't have big plans so i just wanted to go back to what i did which was working well for me and that's when i think uh, somewhere around that time i got a call from orkila and he like hey i heard about the ramen kids do you want to meet and chat and see if you all go pop up hmm at the time pop ups were not really a big thing right no it was unheard of yeah, pop ups right. were unheard of like and um, i think it was a way of, for kotia to get their fmb programming back in stream hmm. or to activate a new kind of uh, sort of activity yeah. right and i said okay tired of packing boxes <laughs> you know <laughs> might as well uh, actually plate food like a chef yeah. is supposed to right i remember the first uh, visit to kotia it was a coffee shop hmm. Down you can't recognize it now. There's no yeah. way nobody anybody recognizes it. And we have pictures from our pop-ups like it's a coffee shop or the counter, and it looked like a ramen counter. And there was one bench where people could sit. And um, I said, okay, why not? I mean, you know, it's very interesting. And um, cooking ramen live and serving that. and the product is the way you want it for me mm-hmm. in its prime new people trying yeah, yeah that that was the excitement right. was when me and i said okay when um, this is still me alone i think oh. now <laughs> i started prepping for 3 days and instead of packing it put it all in bigger box right. so this is me buying camels okay, camels was not like hey <laughs> i need something to keep it in so it's me buying camels and uh, driving it to courtyard yeah and along the way i had started buying small things for sure i figured out a way to ship things from japan so yeah. i got my spools my strainers you know those yeah this proper ramen right. stuff yeah no. um being a back in the house person um, and when you start something mm. there's no compromise in the back of the house stuff mm. right okay. like uh, your nice cutting board Spoons, everything has to be spot on. Kitchen is spot on, man. It's because you're working there. Mm. That's your office, right? Mm. You don't have an AC office with a fancy lighting, <laughs> yeah. mood lighting situation. <laughs> you make sure all your spoons and everything's are perfect, right? So yeah, we packed everything into cameras. Um, sometimes my driver used to help me and mm. load the car mm. and drive me here. And then here I came in uh, where an old employee called Barka was in charge of the cafe food. So they used to move the whole coffee machine, everything set up. Right. Um, so small counter like this, and this is the space we had. We had uh, two home burners. I think Akla borrowed a mum's burner for me to heat soup, and I did only two soups that time. Oh, okay. So non-veg, right. no veg, right? right. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, When was that? Papa. The first pop up over here. 21 21 21 September I think okay if i am not wrong and this uh, is six covers eight covers like what should that table would seat how many no, no. table was four mm. and we had on about at least 10 more oh. on the table out of this was 20 so covers this and crowd 20 uh, cover uh, yeah right. and we had all got this japanese like um, yeah curtains the whole yeah set up right the like oh yeah the the, the set up I've never seen a setup like that for mm-hmm. anything because people are coming back from the lockdown into something. I had to like feel something. I meant like all hands on deck. Like oh. the kind of setups we've done for pop ups is ridiculous. I don't think it's that. That's what was missing in pop ups back then. Right? People would yeah. just come and do the food, and there was nothing done around the place that would give you the vibe. Yeah, and With then I did. I remember I did three pop ups, and every one was different setup. Mm. There was one which there was a walk through. 
how this Raman journey, my photograph from Japan, my knives, my apron, everything is on display. Mm. That was the first one. I think the second one, we emulated like a street from Shibuya. Or oh. There's a projector with the streets of Japan. <laughs> That's we made a street walk, so she put these plastic stickers on the concrete, mm. which she couldn't get off later, so <laughs> it was stuck. It was stuck for the entirety of the la that 2022. And then I have a Japanese bike which we parked, which is part of the prop. Oh wow. Uh, it was like... This is the Kawasaki. Yeah, it's the Kawasaki. So we, it was the second pop-up. It was like fully neon, right. Shibuya Y cyber So we were doing like big proper things. Yeah. And the first pop-up, my mom, my mom does flower arrangement like yeah. Ikebana. Yeah. So she did a centerpiece for every table. This is a Japanese arranged, arranged send pickup. So we did a couple of these, mm. and that's when I think Naru got really like started getting things. And even then, then I think I was handling this ticketing on air menus with. I was talking to them mm. a lot, like you know, uh, if you ask them, they'll tell you how. Is there was back and forth, like yeah, yeah, a lot of back and forth. It's a Bangalore-based thing, air menus. I think so, yeah. Okay. I think I think so. Uh, I mean, it's available by hand in India, but mm. uh, a lot of the things were me telling them, man, I need a counter. Mm. And she, she, I can't have people more than book so much. This, that, this, that. And then a lot of development has happened with that. And it still happens today, I mean, like, you know, because uh, all the one star Google reviews mm. are through I can't get a reservation. Or, I don't know, it's like a new bag. And, um, well, Does that piss you off though? Because it's it like used, you start. It, it used to. It used to and I was like um, very close to getting into a conversation with that. And I have sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then it is what it is. Like, you know, um, we get a lot of flack for being rigged. Uh, like I'm <laughs> selling ramen only to my friends. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, what's the point of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they they always always know, know, If you only feed right? people, if I only keep feeding you ramen, like you know, nobody else is going to know about it. And how are you going to make money? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, but no, it's a very fair and square thing. I don't know how people book it so fast. I can give it to be on me, but uh, there's been times where I've sent a video recording of the bookings coming in hmm. to people on Instagram. Yeah. To say, hey, this is it's not rigged. <laughs> this, this is the see the time of it. You know. Yeah. 30 seconds, it is. 30 seconds into the opening of the thing, the first start booking start coming and it just goes on. Yeah. So, well, I'm not cheating, but... But come to think of it, it's the best one star review, right? I couldn't get through reservation. That already tells you, okay, it's... Yeah, th this, no, place is for this is one of the mellow ones. You should see the best. Ah, the I've best. seen a few comments yeah. on the general post. People yeah. Are, yeah. There's, it's usually people who didn't get through just ranting that... Uh, uh, there's a lot of feedback on how the booking system should be. Right. And I understand, right? And yeah. uh, it's still a small brand. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh. Could I invest in like a fancy, like, bling website with heavy bandwidth mm. and uh, all the data sort of, like Nike, for mm. example. Mm. Nike does show drops, Correct. right? Yeah. yeah. But Nike is Nike. Nike. Mm. And we have yeah. this whole queue system, that, yeah. you know. Developing a website like that is expensive. Yeah. And I don't know if the size of Naru right now for 20 seats, I mean, everything put together, we probably feed 400 people a week. Whoa. Even now, it's 400 people a week, that's nothing. Right? Right. Does it warrant me having to uh, create a brand new website for it? No, and we've been working with this thing. It's like, it's an ongoing process that can happen. But, uh, yeah lot of lack for booking still. So to answer your question, the first one, no, it's not helped. <laughs> Last week, because of the elections, we moved our booking to a Sunday oh, instead yeah. of a Monday or oh, one day. Uh, In about two years, we've changed the Monday to a Sunday okay. once. People are not happy. This year. When you work so hard to build a routine, you want to keep it. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, is met with a lot of dissatisfaction. I'm sure when you move the 6 p.m. booking time to 8 p.m. That I didn't because it. people asked me. Oh, people okay. are like, hey man, like you know, 6 I'm I don't know if you know what a regular job feels <laughs> like, but uh, 6 p.m. is when we just finish work. Or some of us are still on calls. Yeah. So then uh, I moved to 8. Mm. 
I first started, I think it was Thursday, 12 noon. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of it is tuned to when I feel I had enough time for me to prep. Yeah. So it started like that. Okay. Mm. It started like, hey, if I sell these ramen kits on this day at this time, mm. from then if I prep, I can put the food out by Sunday. Sunday. It started as a necessity for me. Yeah. For me to have enough time. Time. And then it just continued because that was that Naru sort of uh, uh, experience, yeah. if you might say it. But I've always wondered, like, how, to what extent is it necessary for an experience abroad to actually uh, to master your craft, or if you just want to, uh, you know, consider being a chef professionally, is it necessary? You say. Think how uh, I mean kitchens now, now as of 2024 mm -hmm. in Bangalore and in India, up to the levels that international kitchens operate on mm. now maybe before they were but there were fewer kitchens right um it's just great from a, mat, a standpoint of view that you get to experience a different sort of kitchen and now this whole mm. word cuisine is from the french thing right so it's a lot of french influence so if you could experience a french kitchen say in france and you see what the system is like, the hierarchy is like, and, you, and the setup is like, right? Probably bring a little bit back of that here with you, right? Um, like, but now I said there's some fantastic kitchens in Bangalore and Bombay and set up better than international kitchens. Yeah. That did we have it back then. Mm. I still came back to Olive for right after my thing because I thought, okay, this has been set up by somebody who graduated from my school. Yeah, There's a, I was going to ask, did it help? Like, because coming from America to Bangalore, yeah. you were missing a lot of the things that you were doing there, like in terms of equipment or ingredients. So to make that transition to understand, okay, the industry in my country limits me to this, did it help coming and joining Olive because Chef Manu had also, or must have... That was the thought issue. process, right? Um, and I was like, okay, this is going to be the easiest uh, slope of progression because you come in and... Um, you're not, you can't start working in like a, a say, an Indian kitchen. It's not too it's big not of a easy. step down. It's not easy. Uh, I wouldn't say step down, but it's like a foreign. Like, right. it works differently. Like, I didn't know, I didn't learn how to use a tandoor in uh, CIA. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how would I come and do that here? So, then the easiest thing was, approach was to work in, um, in a kitchen that was set up in somebody who went to CIA. At that time, there was two people. Uh, Girish was also there. Uh, I mean, uh, Girish was there. It was Girish like was also CIA. No. I actually spoke to Chef Girish in Paul to get an interview with Chef Manu. Hmm. And, uh, that's how that happened. Yeah. And the first thing I think Chef Manu also said was, "There's no farmers market. You can walk to on Union Square, pick up five ingredients hmm. that you really like. It's been grown with care, and you come back and you make it happen." And uh, at that point of time, this is 2012, I think. And he was like, man, you've got to do what you can go, what to go, do in India with what you have here. Hmm. That was the thing, right? And then Olive set up, say, Olive was a great sort of platform. And that's why you had so many people come there. Yeah. And then that was if I do their own the thing. time when Chef Thomas was also there? No, I think Thomas was just moved to Bombay or something. Uh -huh. But it was me, Chef Varun, Chef Girish, Chef Prashant. Prashant, Anirudh, Anirudh runs Brickhaven uh, now. Brickhaven now, yeah. And, um, yeah, that was the golden age for Olive. Like, so many people I came out of that. I know, we still talk about it. And, uh, we have a picture, I think there's this um, bench right outside Olive where everybody sits and smokes. I think we have a picture where all of us are doing costing in our breaks, <laughs> in our whites, you know, and, uh, I think Olive might be the last job where I was clean shaven for, yeah. I, it was a mandate then, mm. Mm. Uh, but then when I enjoyed, I, when I took my next job, I said, is a beard okay, I'll keep it clean. Uh, first thing I asked. <laughs> yeah. The next was straight uh, beard. Oh, it, oh, oh, it, yeah. So the next was Pamatomo. And um, yeah. But that's again a cuisine shift, right? Mm. So but I think process technique wise, still did what we could do in terms of, for example, there was a pandi curry spare rib, right? Yeah, yeah. The ribs were cooked in a braise, which is not a yeah, South yeah. Indian way to cook it, right? Uh, in an oven, mm -hmm. in a rational oven. So, techniques and processes we used were very 
sort of European American sort of thing with flavors were very true to homes. Yeah, when I was a crazy man, man, I, 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 I <laughs> the the thing to be proud of is you couldn't find one thing on that menu yeah. that it could be it. somewhere else. Mm. Yeah, as in it was not. A, oh yeah, you will find this on a different menu. Mm. The names, the ingredients, uh, fully like. And even the dishes that I remember, you had an Andhra chicken chicken, mm. and I had experimented with Andhra chicken chicken back at Cafe Lota. And it is a spice. It has to be spicy. That has to be spicy. It has to be like Nagar, you know. Yeah, it has. That is the. So yeah. I remember when I ordered, I was like, okay, if it's not spicy, then then uh, this is not the Andhra chicken chicken that. And it came and it was spot on. So yeah. that point, I was just like, okay. Then no, new dishes and different. the classic ones. It was very different. We used to serve it on Napam and um, we had some chefs that we worked with that, you know, were ideating some of the stuff. And I was just about getting ready to put my own stuff on the menu. And mm-hmm. then a lot of stuff that did make the menu was great. There are some that didn't. And I think um, that was my first foray into sort of like regional sort of thing. Food. And that quickly shifted. Was like, and then it started, uh, got in handing down more responsibilities, handle, toy, and uh, openings of these restaurants in Bombay, Pune. Mm. So that was a great exposure, you know, um, because you were managing big teams, right? And it's a different kind of a challenge. It's 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 not easy. It's not easy. Crazy so like toy is always. I've never oh. seen toy. Yeah. Not so. Yeah. And you go on a Monday or a Wednesday and it's the jam fashion there. That was the child that was right. Uh, Keeping that production in every day is heavy production. Yeah. There's no lean day. Lean day. Uh, and there's no lean day and then that's good sort of it it it, it preps you, you know. Food's always fresh because yeah. it's just it's, like it's just a cycling, there's nothing yeah. there's nothing to freeze. It's all Going out, you know, right, yeah. washing the flow in. But it's such yeah. a smarter way to build a business. Like usually people go all guns out that we get the uh, rent and we build mm. the whole restaurant and then they think about how the demand mm. comes. Mm. In your case, it was that you uh, also scaled up depending upon the sort of demand that was there. Right? Oh, so that's why I, I have this line that I say to every customer and it, I've said it so many times, they not exclusive by attitude. Uh, I do want it to be small because I want it to be like, mm. We're exclusive by design because we're a small space. So we're exclusive by the nature of the space. The space dictates how many people I can fill in. Yeah. The food, it takes some certain amount of time, the process. Those things dictate how many oh, people we're able to feed a day. Yeah. And right now, in Aru, with full staffing, we're able to feed about 80 people a day. And I'm, I think that is... Quite a lot of stuff. It's decent, yeah, 80 bowls of ramen. But a shop like this size in Japan would serve about 450 people in a day. In a day. In a day. And but the but the of standing in lines and waiting is also not there. Yeah, anymore, right? the turnaround yeah. in Japan, if you're taking more than 15 minutes to finish a bowl of ramen and get out, it's not cool. So the understanding that the bowl of ramen is expensive, not because there's a lot of extra costs. It's just that the price of everything that you yeah. use yeah. is expensive. So there was a um, there's a Japanese who came in. And was like, oh my god, the uh, ramen is a thousand oh making a lot of money. Like yeah, well, but how much is a masala dosa in Tokyo? Mm. Right, yeah, yes. it's ten thousand yen, right? right? Why? It's just rice and lentils, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But it's a specialty dish. We can't compare it to uh, something you eat in Japan as a staple. Mm. In Japan, also the ramen rates have increased. Increased. Yeah. You can get a great bowl. You still get a good bowl for five hundred, six hundred yen, that's mm. three hundred, four hundred rupees. Okay. Mm. But right now, it's not uncommon for people to charge thousand, thousand two hundred. And the more specialty, the more hype the shop has, right, they right. get away with charging about 800, 700 bucks a bowl of ramen. And cut to India, man, you're importing a lot of stuff, and stuff. import laws are not easy on you. Right. And there are some things that I really need for this ramen that I can't import. Yeah. There are people coming in carrying some fish for me. And like, well, yeah. so now is available. Congo is available, yeah. but like some dried fish, mm. sardines, yada yada. Yeah, people carry them in for us, right? Every equipment is specialized, right? You know, hey. you just got this golden machine, like, don't you? Oh, no, but all the gas night. Yeah. Oh. What is the production on that? Like, how many? You can do hundred portions an hour on that machine. Is the rated one, but we use it three times a week. Okay. Uh, it's not being used right. for its extensive. Okay. But I still get the quality award. Yeah. So. 
I I said someone I didn't I didn't buy it for the amount of portions it makes. I, mean, I buy I bought it for the quality it makes. Oh, it's a it's a very large machine for the shop my size. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if I were to add like a shop or two, it could still take up that load easily. It could be like the central wall uh, machine for making moves. That's but are there like plans of opening? Um. Well. Uh, just to combat this supply demand, I think there are some ideas where another shop, but not like this, you know, if you keep it limited, small, uh, like a quick service. So you say it's more closer to that Japanese format of it's, ramen shop? That's what I wanted to do, right? but I ended up with uh, a seated sort of mm. mean sort of situation. Mm. Uh, but like a proper Japanese ramen shop where there's no waiter, you yeah. punch in, there's this uh, vending machine. Mm-hmm. You get a ticket and then you place the ticket on the counter and the chef makes your order. Mm-hmm. It's not much um, communication. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very plain and simple. Mm-hmm. What you see is what you get kind of thing. And But I don't know because uh, it's a different audience, right? So The lines also, I, I mean, I would presume that would be an issue, right? Because people would take a little bit more time to eat a full bowl of ramen and then mm-hmm. That would take so. That was actually thinking of another brand that came into mind, which I had saw in Paris. So it's called Kodawari. Mm, uh, I know them. It's a yeah. small chain in yeah. Paris. And uh, the way that I kind of saw them scale was uh, they had separated their outlets in terms of only red meat in one outlet and seafood in one mm. outlet as well. Mm-hmm. So do you think that is a kind of a, a logical and a viable kind of path that you would consider as well? Not separating meats. Now again, opening an all vegetarian ramen shop would be one, mm. but then that that you're limiting yourself because uh, yeah, because uh, somebody like a Tushar would want to eat a tonkotsu. Mm. So again, this shop will have about four different ramens, but might I mean the current Naru has about 14 ramen on menu. Mm. I don't think that's viable in a small shop right, format. Right. You want to. Um, we had a small menu first, people are like, oh, small menu. Now we have a big menu, you know, people find it difficult to order. They get scared, sort of intimidated, intimidated yeah, intimidated by the size of the menu. Oh. And it's all simple, it's just variations of the same bra. Yeah. You want to keep it nice, cut and clean, four or five things in the menu, small, um, no reservations. I don't know. <laughs> Good scene. Just quickly going back to the transition from uh, the cloud kitchen to first having a physical place. Home kitchen, home yeah, kitchen. yeah. Actually, yes. So maybe one set of challenges that you probably, I mean, I've confidently said you would have faced is the team building side. Right. right? How right. do you kind of assemble the right team uh, to go about um, you know, growing your brand and all of that? So how was that experience for you? Uh, did you struggle in kind of putting up a team together? Uh, Bad experience. What? How? Did no, I mean it's been mostly been great for me. I've gotten lucky to have such a great team. First of all, uh, with Naru, and I think it's been built very organically. Right? Restaurants will build a people build a larger restaurant and they put out ads hiring Correct. Yeah. every category, yeah. like whatever you want, you can get a job here for. But I worked alone for about two years on this product, so. The good thing is I knew every aspect of every every angle of the product. Yeah. The cooking, of course, and the packing. <laughs> yeah, again, the packing of it. But uh, anyway, I, I didn't want to do a takeaway thing. So the packing part is still there somewhere, yeah. but uh, we didn't use it that much. But every aspect of it, in terms of an all-round production to execution, what, that knowledge was there. Now the time for it to find someone to do it for you. And I'm, I'm very lucky with the people who came to me looking for a job. And a lot of people came, but they saw it's like, it was this small little tiny restaurant. Mm. And I think Tapa is one of our main chefs. Like, um, he joined me when I didn't have a restaurant, but I had a plan of opening a restaurant. So he, he literally used to come home. Oh. It's a cook in our home kitchen. I trained him in my house. So, and for a, for a guy like that who's worked in professional kitchens to come and learn from home, means there's some kind of a personal part. personal interest also. Mm. Huh? A lot of people will like, they most people work for the payout, right? Mm. Which is rightly so. I understand. But if you don't have that added interest and faith in a person, you can't do it. Mm. I could pay him all the money in the world, but for somebody to come work in my house, hoping that this restaurant will open at some point of time. Sometimes restaurants don't open. Don't open. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, it was a pre-opening star. Same with Ezra. She came in like, my thing is, if you want to work with us, usually I say work a couple of days, you know, and then gives you an idea of what the job is. Yeah. Gives me an idea of who you are. Right, right. And a lot of these, oh, I joined, but I didn't think it'll be like this, so I quit. That doesn't happen. Touch wood. Where was this? Just, yeah. So uh, the trial format has what worked for you? Trial format, I don't ask them, can you make me a ramen? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to make me a ramen. I don't want to eat your ramen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, but like, I'm just like, can you work with us yeah. the way we operate? And we operate uh, in a very professional manner, in the kitchen at least. Like, you know, there's everything that you need to cook. Oh. But are you built for it? <laughs> so yeah, Kavan, I take it that service is about to start. So I think yeah, it's uh, just about time. Uh, okay. Maybe we should take this to another place. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is, so, uh, this is the big review, guys. <laughs> uh, we see Kavan in his element. Uh, uh, before, yeah. And so, we're going to grill him a little bit for the remainder of the show. Uh, but before we head to that, I just wanted to quickly ask you, uh, related to the team building aspect, right? right. Something that I've heard. Yeah. Uh, from others is that you consciously try to make an effort to bring your team to different places, mm -hmm. whether it's restaurants or, or even your wedding is something that I've heard recently, right? So, if I ask you why, what's the purpose behind that and what do you gain from that? I mean, it does, it does help, it does help that uh, we have a small team, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I work for bigger companies that have bigger teams that do a team outing, usually on October 2nd because it's a dry day. Hmm. So you back up the whole team and you go because you have an excuse to do so. Right. And what I do here with the small team is we work very closely, right? There's no... We've not handed out uh, kitchen designations like hierarchy. Obviously, we tell them, hmm. hey, so he's leading and he leads and take. But we work as equals and we try to do, share our responsibilities, right? Hmm. So what happens when you do that is it's very important that you also connect outside of work a little bit. Now we have people who become really good friends at work, but we also have people like not really talking to people at work. And then what happens when we go for a dinner or a lunch together is that kind of hope. We hope it might not happen the first time or the second time, but the bonding is going to happen at some point. You know, yeah. how often do you do it? Yeah. Once a month, at least. Once, a once a month. month. And how do you choose where you t is it uh, more yeah. Asian restaurant to get them an idea? Of yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, uh, is it just generic? Like from there or But then it's like restaurants I've gone to and yeah. I really like and I want to visit. Yeah. Or make them experience it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did a local food. We did another Japanese restaurant. We've done something else. And then so like that. Something I mean not KFC for example, like, you know, it's just <laughs> yeah, something uh, restaurant based, see what people are doing. This yeah. thing is also a learning process, right? Show them another space and be like, okay, see how, see, see the level at which they're operating on. Yeah. We and can learn something. Of being the guests, you, yeah. being in the kitchen, yeah. you get into that mentality of always yeah. being in the kitchen. Yeah. I think that's one thing uh, we sort of forget. Yeah. How is it to be the guest? Yeah. How is it to be served? Correct. And yeah. then if you didn't like this, why, why would you do this? Yeah. You know? yeah. If you didn't like the hair coming in your food, like, you know, Generally, temperature-wise, food-wise, yeah. And with the team, uh, aside from that, is training also something that you try to recurringly do with so, the team? So, um, as opposed to larger brands that have systematic periodic mm. training, which we haven't yet started, training here happens on the job, kind of. Because such a small space, it's a small menu where everybody's working with somebody. Right. It uh, doesn't demand for a training of sorts mm. in terms of... Uh, a scheduled sort of training time hmm. where people are learning what to do. Right. It's in such close quarters that it's a hands-on training, you know. It's yeah. it's part of the job at some point. Yeah. Makes sense. So we'll end this segment. We'll finish off with a rapid fire. Okay. Kind of uh, ask you a few tough questions maybe. Okay. We'll give it a okay. bit short. Um, but yeah, um, first question, if you had to stick with one bowl of ramen for Naru, uh -huh. uh, what ramen would that be? i uh, show you a uh, very easy sort of first thing because I grew up eating tonkotsu and then that was the favorite thing. But then you realize after some time, like uh, shoyu is, is a clear light soup, there's nothing to hide behind, you know. Mm. Next question would be, uh, okay, which is what is your go-to meal? I think... Mm. Like curd rice is what I would take. No. no, curd rice is what I ate all through school and college. Yeah, so it's like not for go to meal now. At least, okay. yeah, 
Is Delhi a roll of burger? Not necessarily Nauru, uh, but if you had to consider another city to mm-hmm. expand to, mm-hmm. I think Bombay is great, except mm-hmm. for the weather sometimes, which I can't deal with. Apart from Nauru, like shout out to what you think is a good ramen in India. There's something called Zuru Zuru, and there is one more called Long Finish, mm-hmm. and this is by Kunal. Okay. Uh, the both one is Haryana Delhi, something around that region. Mm-hmm. Over the question. course of your mm-hmm. professional career. Mm-hmm. If you had to say who your best mentor was, or who mm-hmm. your top mentor, what you took away and all of that, mm-hmm. what were your learnings from? It? I mean, we did, we did have this one being big uh, mentor figure in my life, which is uh, at or the VCA chef Manu, and I think uh, a lot more than um, education in the kitchen, it was just uh, education of situations and how to handle them and the way things were done. And how to be successful chef in India course 101 kind of situation is very apt for the time and uh, space we're in and I think there are a lot of learning to take from how he's run multiple facets of a company in so many ways he's worked with them so you know you just and then still at the end of the day throw on somebody on the line they can Cook, cook, mm. cook, cook that line. That's very important, you know. Right. It's easy to be a businessman, but if you call yourself a chef and, and, and that person makes mm. food, yeah. Mm. And so I said, even now I, I can pick up Ramon at yeah. least, you know. And to be able to call yeah. yourself both, basically. Yeah, okay. so then yeah. sometimes it's something typically you have to I enjoy coming back on the line. Mm. You need to enjoy that because otherwise it's never, never really running food business. You don't mm. enjoy what you do. You yeah. can't do this stuff. Mm. It's, it's excruciatingly long and painful. Yeah, the, yeah. Do you enjoy the entrepreneur part? Like that's the stress. No, yeah, it is a stress. It's a stress bit, but you know, we've been lucky with um, how Naru is sort of built. Uh, we've not had touch wood. Yeah, we've not had to uh, cut too many corners. You know, mm-hmm. we're just doing what you are, and then the toughest part is saying no, and that's that's difficult. You know. And then some people you can't say no to. Yeah. So who are those people? Okay, <laughs> <last question. laughs> uh, who gets a uh, 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 cheated the, the reservation? The, the landlord, I guess. <laughs> so I can the landlord, my my chicken vendor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got, yeah. There was a yeah, yeah. 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 We got a lot of uh, great conversation out of it. Big chef, pleasure. Thank Such you. a bloody pleasure having Thank you. you. Yes. Thanks for coming. Really, it was a pleasure. Excellent conversation. Thank really you. loved it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to to seeing. Grace, you got to do a little bit of it here, na. Yeah, 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 yeah nothing. Yeah, approves in the pudding kind of situation.